So we've seen Savitri arriving in the forest in the home where she will live with Satyavan and his parents. And last week we read that at first she was so extremely happy to be with him. Mm -hmm. But then the summer faded away and uh, the rain tide came and then she became aware of the passing of time and the mood of the earth changed and um, sh the grief of all the world came near to her. So I'm going to read on from there. Page 469, near the top. In the, in the night when it's raining. Mm. <coughs> Night's darkness seemed her future's ominous face. The shadow of her lover's doom arose and fear laid hands upon her mortal heart. The moments swift and ruthless raced, alarmed her thoughts, her mind remembered Narad's date. A trembling moved accountant of her riches. She reckoned the insufficient days between. A dire expectancy knocked at her breast. Dreadful to her were the footsteps of the hours. Grief came, a passionate stranger to her gate. Banished when in his arms, out of her sleep it rose at morn to look into her face. Vainly she fled into abysms of bliss from her pursuing foresight of the end. The more she plunged into love, that anguish grew. Her deepest grief from sweetest gulfs arose. Remembrance was a poignant pang. She felt each day a golden leaf torn cruelly out from her too slender book of love and joy. Thus, swaying in strong gusts of happiness and swimming in forebodings somber waves and feeding sorrow and terror with her heart. For now they sat among her bosom's guests, or in her inner chamber paced apart. Her eyes stared blind into the future's night. Out of her separate self she looked and saw moving amid the unconscious faces loved. In mind a stranger, though in heart so near, the ignorant smiling world go happily by upon its way towards an unknown doom and wondered at the careless lives of men. As if in different worlds they walked, though close, they 
confident of the returning sun, they wrapped in little hourly hopes and tasks. She, in her dreadful knowledge, was alone. The rich and happy secrecy that once enshrined her as if in a silver bower, apart in a bright nest of thoughts and dreams, made room for tragic hours of solitude and lonely grief that none could share or know. A body seeing the end too soon of joy and the fragile happiness of its mortal love. So we'll go back to the beginning of that passage. You'll begin, Rosa. Night darkness seemed to show futures, ominous face. Mm. The shadow of her, her love, her doom arose, and fear laid hands up upon her mortal calm. Go on. The moment swift and ruthless, ruthless rest around her thoughts, her mind remembered night's day. Yes. So when she wakes in the the stormy night. That darkness of the night seems to her like the ominous face, the threatening face of her future. And then, like a shadow coming up, the memory of the, the doom of Satyavan, of her lover, rose up in her, she remembers. And fear laid hands upon her mortal heart. This is the first time she's having any experience like this of grief and fear. No? And time seems to pass so quickly, swift and ruthless. Ruthless is merciless, cruel. No? They, are, they are not stopping for anything. They are passing. No? They race past and alarmed her thoughts and her mind remembered Narad's date. Narad has told them the exact day when Satyavan must die. So she knows when that date is. <coughs> Martin. Trembling moved the fountain of the riches. She reckoned the insufficient days between a dire expectancy knocked at her breast. Dreadful to her were the footsteps of the hours. Grief came, a passionate stranger to her gaze, banished when in his arms. How the first leave it rose at morn to look into her face. Mm, yes. So it says that she's an accountant of her riches. She's counting like a, like a miser. How many days are left? How much more time do I have with, uh, with Satyavan? And even there's fear in that. No, she's, she's trembling. She's reckoning, counting the insufficient days between between the moment she's in 
and that day, Narad's date, saw the footsteps of the hours, the passing of time is dreadful to her. Grief came, a passionate stranger. Grief has been a complete stranger to her until now. No. But now he enters, comes to her gate. That grief is banished. If you banish somebody, you send them out of the country. No, they, they are nowhere to be seen. So that grief is banished when she's in Satyavan's arms, in his embrace. But when she wakes up in the morning, now that's when we feel it. The grief uh, gets up in the morning and looks into her face. Then she sees it. Mm. Gumsun. Mm. Mm. Yeah, one thing you're passionate, stranger. Grief is... Yes, grief. There's something intense about grief, no? Passion is intensity of feeling, yes. And his, that grief that is an emotion that has been a stranger to her. Now it's becoming familiar. Mm -hmm. Then she pointed into the into the place from a pushing whole side of the end. Continue. Mm. The more she plunged into love, the anguish grew. But the cost grief from sweetest gods or rose. You can read the next one also. Remembrance was a poignant pan. She felt each day a golden leaf torn cruelly out. From her two slender people love and joy. Yes. So she could run away from grief into abysms of bliss. Abysms are the deepest place in the ocean. No? So she could plunge deep into bliss. But it's in vain because um, that uh, foresight that foreknowledge of the end pursues her, follows after her. And the more that she plunged into love, the more that anguish, that pain grew, the more painful it become, became. So that her deepest grief, her deepest suffering rises out of those sweetest gulfs, those gulfs, those abysms of bliss and happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, when memory comes, remembrance, even remembering the happiness is a painful thing, a poignant pain, a sharp pain, because she felt that each day is like a page torn out of the book of her jo love and joy, as if those days that she has with Satyavan, they are like pages of a book, they are bound together, but each day that's passed, one of those pages, one of those leaves, we can call this a leaf, over leaf sometimes it says, it means on the next page. Hmm? torn cruelly out, so cruel to tear out one of those lovely golden uh, leaves, one of those beautiful days, but it's gone forever no? out of her too slender. Slender is thin. It's not a very big thick book like this. She doesn't have so many uh, days. She only has 365 days no? and some of them have already gone. Sergei. The sway and strong length of happiness and swimming in four bodies on the waves and feeling sorrow and terror with your heart. Turn out, they said, among her blossoms' guests. Or 
Intra inner chamber phase apart. The eyes stare right into the future's night. Yes. So she's swaying, perhaps like a tree in a storm. Strong winds coming, the tree is blown down and then the wind goes a different direction. So she's swaying in strong gusts, strong wind pressure no? of happiness. Well, happiness is like a wind. No? She's swaying in these strong gusts of happiness. And then when, the, when Satyavan is not with her, when she's not with him, she's swimming in the somber waves. She's in a d dark sea of foreboding. Foreboding is when you have a, a feeling, or in her case, a knowledge, that something bad is going to happen. At the very beginning of the poem, we have that, the huge foreboding mind of night. The mind of night feels the approach of the light, which will dissolve it. It doesn't want that to come. It's foreboding. And it's as if there are uh, beings eating at her heart, feeding sorrow and terror, terror, intense fear with her heart. Those guests, sorrow and terror, are sitting among the guests at her, at her table in her bosom or when she's alone in her inner chamber or in her deeper being, they walk up and down. Oh, sorrow and terror, there they are. So her eyes stared blind. She can't really see what will happen, but it looks very dark, the, the future's night. Her future will be a night. And that's echoing what we read before. Night's darkness seemed her future's ominous face. Alice. Out of her separate self, she looked and saw, moving amid the unconscious faces love, in mind a stranger, though in heart so near. The ignorant, smiling world go happily by, upon its way towards an unknown doom and wondered at careless lives of men. Yes. So, from her inner being, her separate self, she looked out as she's moving among these people that she's living with, the people that she meets every day. They are unconscious. She loves them. She loves, gives her love to everybody. But, um, she feels separated the, from them in mind, in consciousness, because she knows something that they don't know. No. So in that way, um, they are strangers, although they are tied closely by the heart, by love. No. So she sees the ignorant, smiling world go happily by. People are just go living their lives. They don't know. They are ignorant. They don't realize that their road, their way, is leading them towards doom, towards a disaster, something very, very painful and terrible. No? But they don't know that. It's unknown to them. And so they can happily live their lives. So she wonders, she's surprised, she's amazed by how people can live so in such a carefree way, 
without anxiety, without the grief of foreknowledge, without uh, yes, suffering. Mm -hmm. Leila. Yes. It, so she seems to be in a different world, walking and living in a different world from the people around her, even though they are so close, because they are sure that tomorrow the sun will rise, everything will be as usual. They are absorbed, wrapped up in their little hopes and tasks from hour to hour through the day. They are not looking into the future with dread. She is alone in her dreadful knowledge. This is the great test and ordeal of foreknowledge. Mother says that uh, most human beings simply wouldn't be able to live if they knew what is going to happen. So we are protected, we can't see into the future. But she, to her, the future has been revealed and this is a terrible burden, a terrible difficulty. You'll read, dear? Yeah? Hmm? Will you read? Yes. So she's always, in a way, lived apart from other people. Although she loves them, she spreads her love around, she's affectionate, but there's something in her which is separate and solitary. And that used to be a rich and happy secrecy mm -hmm. that was like a kind of shrine, a protection around her as if in a silver bower. A bower is a, uh, actually it's a, it's a private room for a lady <laughs> where she can uh, be with herself and uh, separate from other people. Private place. So she's carrying something like that in herself this bright nest, like a bird has its nest, its little place. And her nest was made up of thoughts and dreams. That apartness, that secrecy, now it makes room for tragic hours of solitude when she's alone and suffering, lonely grief that none could share or know. She can't tell anybody. No? She has to bear this all alone. No? And what is the nature of that grief that she's suffering? It's actually herself, her body, seeing the end too soon of its joy, that joy of being together with Satyavan. And it's seeing that the fragile happiness of its mortal love will end too soon. Mm. Joel. A quiet visage, still and sweet and calm. A graceful daily act wear now a mask. In vain 
In vain she looked upon her depths, depths to find the ground of stillness and the spirit's peace. Hmm. So she's not giving any outward sign of her grief. At the beginning in uh, Canto 2, um, Sri Aurobindo mentioned this, that she was too great to share the sorrow and the pain. She keeps it all to herself. She doesn't give any outward sign. So her quiet visage, her calm face, still, sweet, calm, no? And all the things that she did every day, her graceful daily acts, now it's a mask, it's a disguise. It doesn't reflect her inner state. In vain she's trying to find deep inside herself some kind of ground of peace, stillness, but she doesn't find it. Uh, Mahalingam. Hmm? She is playing from the, from the, from the side and then you see his legs drop past the unknown age. Supports the sorrow of the mind and heart and bears in human breast the world and faith. You can read the next, next line also. Links of that is in the presence was in. Yes. So she, she has still not found her inner being, her inner divinity. No? Still veiled from her, it's hidden from her, hmm? was this the silent divinity within the witness who watches life's drama pass without, uh, with unmoved eyes. It means without being disturbed in any way by what happens outside. And that being within supports, gives courage and strength to the sorrow of the mind and heart. And it bears the world and fate, all the, the difficult things we have to face. There's that presence within, inside our um, human breasts. Sri Aurobindo says, we wouldn't be able to bear the, the pressure of the world if it weren't for that strength within us. But she hasn't yet found that being within herself. Sometimes there's a glimpse or a flash, but that presence is hidden. Tamarai will read. Yes. Violent. Violent. Passionate. Immutable. Human, a human lot. Yes. Hmm. So she doesn't find that calm, still, strong being within. All she's got is her heart, which is full of intense feelings, passionate heart violent heart, yes, and her passionate will. Hmm? These she pushes in front to meet this immutable doom, this doom, this dreadful thing that's going to happen that can't be changed, immutable, it won't change. So she meets it with the determination of her heart, strong, violent heart, and her passionate will. This is the, these are the weapons that she has 
to deal with this situation. But she finds herself without any defense, any protection. She's stripped bare of all, um, all kinds of protection that could help her. She's bound, she's tied fast to her human lot. The human lot is suffering, grief, death. <coughs> So the, the will and the heart have no means to act. They, do, they can't do anything really. They have no way to save her. Bhuvana. The sorrowing woman, they saw not me. So, yes, she controls the violent heart with all this uh, extremes of feeling that it's experiencing, the passionate will. Nobody sees that. Nothing was shown outside. To the people around her, she still looks just the same. The child, the young person that they knew and loved. They don't see this woman. Now she's become a mature woman through all these experiences and all her sorrow that is kept within. They don't see that. Beba. Mm, so this is a lovely picture of uh, Savitri as she is living, no? She, she, there's no change in the way that uh, they've seen her before. And what is she doing? How is she moving? She used to be the, the empress in the palace, no? A worship empress. Everybody vied, they competed to serve her. Everybody wanted to be close to her and to do little things for her. Now she makes herself the diligent serf to all. A serf is a person who has to do very humble tasks and sometimes hard tasks. It's a word for a kind of slave. No? But she's very diligent. She does everything very, very carefully and properly um, to um, see that no detail is left undone. Somebody who is diligent, they do all their tasks very carefully and precisely. No? So she serves everybody. And uh, even these humble tasks, sweeping and uh, getting the water from the well, no? or uh, looking after her mother-in-law, her father-in-law, or preparing the fire, two kinds of fire, the altar fire and the kitchen fire. She has to look after them. This is the task of the housewife. No? And she won't allow anybody to do any task that she can do, not even a small thing. No slight task, even a little task, she won't let anybody else do if she can manage it with her woman's strength. Mm. So, Seka, you'll, uh, Suresh, sorry, you'll read. Mm. A strange. Moment she could bring. Her 
oneness with earth glowing rope of, of light, the lifting up of common acts by love. And this is also a beautiful sentence, isn't it? Uh, further up the page he spoke about her graceful daily acts. No? And now he's saying, how, what is this grace? Why they are so graceful, so beautiful to look at? Somehow there's something divine about um, the way that she does everything. In all her acts, a strange divinity shone into a simplest movement Whatever small thing she has to do, she could bring some oneness, some connection with Earth's glowing robe of light. Earth is the material world. All these little tasks she has to do, it has to do with material things. But somehow surrounding this Earth, there's this robe of light, an aura of light, and in the way that she moves and acts, she makes a connection between the little material things that have to be done and that glowing robe of light. And this is because she does everything, all these common acts, she's doing them out of love. So they get raised up into something more than just uh, <laughs> just the acts themselves. They are acts of love. Mm -hmm. um, Dana Lakshmi. All love was hers and its one heavenly call, bound all to all with her as golden time. But when her grief to the surface Pressed too close, these things, once gracious adjuncts of her joy, seemed meaningless to her, a gleaming shell, or were around mechanical and void, her body's actions shared not by the way. Yes. So she's just carrying all love with her. This is her nature, love. Hmm? And that heavenly cord of love connects everything to everything else with her, with herself as its golden tie, the golden thread that connects everything. But now when she's suffering, when her grief comes up too close to the surface, then these things which she used to love to enjoy doing. Once they were gracious adjuncts, they were things that were part of her joy, helping her joy. Hmm? Now they seem meaningless to her, all these daily tasks. It's just a gleaming shell and a beautiful appearance, a nice looking shell. There's nothing inside. No? Or, as uh, household tasks are often to us, perhaps, a mechanical, empty round, just things that have to be done, the washing up, the laundry, the sweeping, no? So these are things which her body does, and her will is not in it. No? Her body's actions shared not by her will. So this is a very unhappy state for her. An adjunct is something that's added on. Junct, like junction, something that's joined to, connected with, added on. So formally, all those tasks that she did, doing them with love, it was part of her joy of being there with Satyavan. But now when the grief comes up too close, then be, these gracious actions begin to seem meaningless and empty or just a, just a shell 
they don't correspond to her inner state anymore. We'll go back to the top of page 469. We can read these lines together. <clears throat> Night's darkness seemed her future's ominous face. The shadow of her lover's doom arose and fear laid hands upon her mortal heart. The moment swift and ruthless raced, alarmed her thoughts, her mind remembered Narad's date. A trembling moved accountant of her riches she reckoned the insufficient days between. A dire expectancy knocked at her breast. Dreadful to her were the footsteps of the hours. Grief came, a passionate stranger to her gaze. Banished when in his arms, out of her sleep it rose at morn to look into her face. Vainly she fled into abysms of bliss from her pursuing foresight of the end. The more she plunged into love, that anguish grew, her deepest grief from sweetest gulfs arose. Remembrance was a poignant pang, she felt each day a golden leaf torn cruelly out from her too slender book of love and joy. Thus, swaying in strong gusts of happiness and swimming in foreboding somber waves and feeding sorrow and terror with her heart, for now they sat among her bosom's guests or in her inner chamber paced apart. Her eyes stared blind into the future's night. Out of her separate self she looked and saw, moving amid the unconscious faces loved, in mind a stranger, though in heart so near, the ignorant, smiling world go happily by upon its way towards an unknown doom and wondered at the careless lives of men. As if in different worlds they walked, though close, they Confident of the returning sun, they wrapped in little hourly hopes and tasks. She, in her dreadful knowledge, was alone. The rich and happy secrecy that once enshrined her as if in a silver bower, apart in a bright nest of thoughts and dreams, made room for tragic hours of solitude and lonely grief that none could share or know. 
a body seeing the end too soon of joy and the fragile happiness of its mortal love. Her quiet visage, still and sweet and calm, her graceful daily acts were now a mask. In vain she looked upon her depths to find a ground of stillness and the spirit's peace. Still veiled from her was the silent being within who sees life's drama pass with unmoved eyes, supports the sorrow of the mind and heart and bears in human breasts the world and fate. A glimpse or flashes came. The presence was hid. Only her violent heart and passionate will were pushed in front to meet the immutable doom. Defenseless, nude, Bound to her human lot, they had no means to act, no way to save. These she controlled, nothing was shown outside. She was still to them the child they knew and loved the sorrowing woman they saw not within. No change was in her beautiful motion seen. A worshipped empress, all once vied to serve, she made herself the diligent serf of all, nor spared the labor of broom and jar and well, or close gentle tending, or to heap the fire of altar and kitchen, no slight task allowed to others that her woman's strength might do. In all her acts, a strange divinity shone. Into a simplest movement she could bring a oneness with earth's glowing robe of light, a lifting up of common acts by love. All love was hers, and its one heavenly cord bound all to all with her as golden tie. But when her grief to the surface pressed too close, these things, once gracious adjuncts of her joy, seemed meaningless to her, a gleaming shell, or were around mechanical and void. Her body's actions shared not by her will. 